Are we ready? Yeah. Yes, all right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Restoration Church. Uh, we're so glad you're here. My name is Jake McLaughlin, and I'm the pastor, and I am joined today by Gail, uh, who's going to be helping us with worship, and with Eddie and Jackie, who will be singing for us today, leading us in music. Um, if this is your first time here at Restoration, I want to especially welcome you, and we're just glad that you're all here with us today. We would love to stay connected with everyone here, so if you will take just a moment and text the word RL here to 29456. That's just a way to make sure that we know who's here, and it's also a way for us to share information with you about things happening in the life of the church. If you desire to follow, follow along in the service, you can scan the QR code behind me, um, or you can go to restorationlab.org slash Sunday, and as you came in, you should have received a communion element uh, along with a card for our prayer time and a pen as well, and we'll share more about those a little bit later. Friends, it is so wonderful to be together in worship today. We're so glad, again, that you're here. Um, welcome. And uh, to prepare our hearts and minds for worshiping God together, please stand as you are able, and let's share together in the call to worship that Gail will lead us.
And Lord, we ask this all in your Son's gracious and holy name, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen? Amen. All right, let's stand up and let's greet one another and our kiddos. Ms. Jennifer is waving her hands wildly back there. You can go on with her. Uh, so friends, there's a couple things happening in the life of the church that I would love to tell you about. The first is uh, Lent uh, starts on Wednesday. And Lent uh, begins with an Ash Wednesday service. And we are doing a joint service with uh, Florist United Methodist Church in Herndon and with our campus in Preston. And so we're going to be doing that at Florist United Methodist Church, which is in Herndon, uh, this Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Um, I'm going to be a part of the worship service, as is Eddie, um, and all the worship leaders and pastors from our different sites. So it will be a wonderful time uh, for us to um, begin the season of Lent. Speaking of which... Um, this sermon series for Lent this year is going to be called What's in a Name? And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the different names um, that Jesus was given by his disciples and by others. Um, if, uh, uh, sorry, this threw me off for a second. It's the right slide. But it just, for some reason, just totally threw me off. I don't know why. Sometimes that happens, y'all. I apologize. So here's the deal. What's in a Name is the sermon series. Lent starts this Wednesday. And then Sunday, we're going to start What's in a Name? Um, for those of you who are interested, we have two life groups that are going to be doing a study around what's in the name. That's Tuesday morning. It's a women's group. And we have Wednesday evening, which is also a group that we'll be meeting. Um, if you are interested in being part of one of those groups, just come see me after the service. And uh, I will direct you to uh, getting engaged with those different groups. And let me also say, for the season of Lent, um, we're going to be putting out these Lent journals. Um, this is a very simple journal that has some scripture in it and it'll allow you to take notes during the sermons, but also we'll be sending out weekly guides um, for those groups and for anyone who wants to really kind of dig deeper into their faith life during the season of Lent, um, that you can fill out information, answer questions, maybe do some deep prayer and, and things along those lines. So as you're leaving today, there, is, um, there will be a stack of these journals just right by the door where you can uh, participate in Lent in this season. Uh, now, there's just two other, two other uh, things that I added uh, yesterday or on Friday. Uh, the first is, let's talk about masks for a second. Okay, so here's the deal. Two weeks ago, uh, if you have kids in LCPS, you got, you got a voicemail at about 8.30, 8.45, maybe, uh, that said, because of the court order, LCPS is now no longer requiring masks. And then the CDC made some changes on Friday night. Um, and so, uh, just so you know, we work collaboratively with our other sites, um, and we have what's called a healthy church team. We have people that are, we have doctors, we have people that work in the health field that help us make decisions. And because we met on Thursday, and the new CDC guidelines came out, we are maintaining our current mask required um, posture. However, friends, I wanna let you all know, um, that will likely shift to a mask optional Within, uh, within the near future. I can't say it'll be next week, but it's very likely um, that that will happen, and we'll still encourage people to wear masks um, and, and the like, but I wanna let you all know to please pay attention to this Thursday's V-note and E-note, um, and we'll likely have information there for you. Uh, now, the other thing I wanna just bring up to you is a little bit different. Um, this is gonna require some uh, participation on your part, uh, but not, uh, please don't scream anything out, okay? So here's the deal. We decided that we were going to do a spring celebration in May. And we're going to do a little bit of everything at this celebration. We're going to have a food truck. We're going to probably do crafts and things for kids. We'll probably uh, have music of some sorts, whether, whether that's, uh, you know, asking Eddie to play a little bit or us just having some, you know, some MP3s playing. Um, we are going to also do a clothing drive and um, we'll do some things for teens as well. So it's going to be kind of a little bit of everything type of celebration. Here's the challenge. What do you name a kind of everything kind of celebration 
other than a kind of everything celebration happening in May. So here's what I would love for you to do. If you all, as you came in, if you have your prayer card, uh, the communion offering prayer card, um, let's take a moment, and if you have an idea for a great name that we can use, would you just take a moment and just write that name on the back of your card? And as you're leaving today, obviously we want you to fill out the card and offer up a prayer and, and those things that are on your heart so that we can pray with you. Uh, but if you have a good name, like Spring Fling, we thought about that one. A lot of people do Spring Flings. I'm open to that. Um, but frankly, we would love to have your help naming this event. It'll likely happen on May 1st, which is the week before Mother's Day. Um, and like I said, there'll be a clothing drive, food trucks, and the like. So if you have a good name, um, what any names that we receive next week, what we'll do is we'll do a minty poll for the next Sunday. And then we'll kind of all decide together what the name is gonna be. And uh, please, uh, you know, uh, please be creative. We would love to hear your different ideas. And then finally, um, I wanna talk a little bit about giving, but I wanna talk about giving in a little bit of a different way. Obviously, we're so grateful for the ways that you all show generosity to Restoration Church, the ways that you allow us to minister to kids, uh, to minister here at Versailles School, to serve our community and the like. Um, the ways that you give allows us to do um, really important ministry and being in the community with one another. That said, today is actually a pretty um, important day for our uh, short history. Today is our third birthday. And uh, I know that's a, uh, not something that we're getting super excited about. It's not something we're doing a huge celebration about. Um, but I just want to talk about it for just a moment. Um, we've been at this now for three months, three, excuse me, three years plus some. Because there were many families that came from Florida United Methodist Church, and then a number of families that we met early on who have helped us get to where we are today. We are still here. In the midst of a pandemic, three weeks after our birthday, our one-year birthday, we became a virtual church. We have, we have seen together the hills and valleys of the last few years. And we've gotten to do it together. We've gotten to do it together. That's really powerful. I was speaking to the leadership team, uh, to the folks that came early to help us set up this morning, um, how powerful it is to be in community with one another. How we can come to this place and experience the grace and mercy of Christ when out in the world we don't necessarily experience those things every day. There's often a frenetic pace to the world that bumps up blood pressure, raises anxiety. But here is different. We're not about success and achievement. We're about love and grace. We're not about how much can we do as quickly as possible. We're about how can we love one another. So I want to say thank you. Thank you so very much for being a part of the work of the church, of a community of faith that longs for something to be different in the world. And because of you, because of the work that we get to do together, we all get to experience the kingdom of God a little bit closer. It's a little bit more real, tangible. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you for that so very much. And I think now, Eddie, and Jackie are going to sing for us.
about what history should and shouldn't be taught in our schools. I think it's a name you should know. Ryan Anderson is one of three documented lynchings of African Americans in Loudoun County, Virginia, between 1890 and 1902. Ryan Anderson was 14 years old. There is a National Historic Landmark in Leesburg, which is actually near the WOMD Trail. You can see the little sidewalk there. That's the WOMD Trail. There's a historical landmark there in Leesburg, and that shares this story, which I would like to offer to you. Excuse me. On November 8, 1889, a 14-year-old African-American boy named Orion Anderson was lynched where Leesburg Freight Depot was located along the Washington and Old Dominion Railroad. A week earlier, Orion was arrested and taken to jail in Leesburg. His alleged offense was scaring a 14-year-old girl from Hamilton by chasing her with a fertilizer bag over his head. Although the girl could not identify him as the person who scared her, Orion was arrested based on circumstantial evidence. Less than 24 hours after the sheriff delivered a summons to the girl and to two other witnesses, and before a judge or jury could hear Anderson's case, 25 to 40 men came into town in the early hours of November 8th. The Richmond Dispatch reported that the men were disguised and that cloth was wrapped around their horses' hooves so they would not make any noise. Three men from his group from this group who were not in disguise went into the jail, requested admittance under the pretense that they were delivering a prisoner to a cell. When the deputy sheriff let them in, they were overpowered, he was overpowered, and they took Anderson out by the jail by force. He was then dragged down Church Street to the freight depot where he would be lynched. Both the deputy sheriff and the night policeman were witnesses to the event. Both stated emphatically that they could not identify any member of the mob, their voices, or their horses. No one was ever convicted of the murder of Orion Anderson. Now, as you can imagine, this story has stayed with me for many reasons. It makes me sad. It makes me angry. And it makes me really uncomfortable. It makes me really uncomfortable. A 14-year-old boy's life was snuffed out because he allegedly scared a girl. The men who had committed this atrocity had no regard for the dignity of Orion's life, nor did they have any regard for the rule of law. And this tragic and unjust moment in our history is not only discomforting, but it speaks to the terror many African Americans experienced in our history. There's been a lot of debate around history lately. And it seems that there are some that believe we shouldn't learn and understand more disturbing aspects of our national history because it might make us uncomfortable. I disagree. I disagree. Now, I'm not saying that our education system should be a free-for-all, where we are teaching any and all subjects with little or no consideration to the maturity level of the students, or the educational merit of a particular topic. But we have to remember the adage by Edmund Burke, which states that those who don't know history are what? Doomed to repeat it. You know, our past and our understanding of the past speaks into our present. It speaks into our futures. In his famed letter to pastors critical of his civil rights work, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King responded to the discomfort his movement caused the Christian community in Birmingham. It was written from a Birmingham prison cell. No doubt, many of these Christian leaders were sympathetic to the cause for civil rights, just not for the nonviolent methods of civil disobedience the movement used. King states, and I quote, Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. And you see this here, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. 
We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. You know, friends, we must confront, learn, and explore our history and our past because it is part of what makes us who we are. We must be discomforted around the biases, generalities, and stereotypes that we hold unfairly against others. We must look at ourselves and each other in the communities with which we call ourselves a part of with accountability because there's no way to experience wholeness. There is no way to experience wholeness in the community or in our own lives without healing and reconciliation. You know, we've been speaking the last few weeks about resilience. Resilience is our ability to overcome challenges and obstacles. And resilience is not our ability to avoid hard things. Resilience is the ability to process and work through hard things in life so that we can thrive when things are in fact hard. Resilience is moving beyond the discomfort we feel so that we can work towards something better. And Jesus. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, was resilient. He called his disciples to be resilient. And if we are to follow Christ, then we have to build our resilience upon a foundation of Christ's teaching rooted in our everyday practices, the ways that we pray, the ways that we read scripture, the ways that we interact with our family, with our neighbors, with our coworkers, and the like. And in today's gospel lesson, Jesus and his disciples are hungry. They were travelers on the road. They didn't hold down regular nine to five jobs. They would travel from town to town teaching, healing, and serving those on, on the margins. There was no income to be made. There was no passing of the plate. Now granted, there was a group of women who supported Jesus and the disciples, and people in the villages they visited likely offered them food and shelter. But there were times when they went without, when they were hungry. And so they did what the poor of the time would do. They would pick and eat grain from the fields. And so the problem then wasn't their hunger. The problem was that the hunger came upon the Sabbath. When, when the Pharisees saw it, they called Jesus out for the, his disciples' actions. He said, they said, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. And hearing that challenge, hearing that discomfort, Jesus responds, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, by the way, but only for the priests. Or have you read in the law that the priests on the Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? So in that moment of discomfort, where does Jesus point the Pharisees to? He points them to the Holy Scriptures to recount a story from King David's life. King David, God's beloved king, who did the same exact thing that the disciples were doing in that moment. He and his men ate bread that they should not have eaten when suffering from hunger. And so the Pharisees see Jesus' disciples' actions not just as breaking the Sabbath, but as an affront to their religious beliefs. But notice Jesus doesn't run away from them. Jesus doesn't try to just, you know, just say, no, I don't want to talk about it. He points out their convenient omissions of their view of the Sabbath and tells them who he is, the Lord of the Sabbath. And in order for Jesus and his disciples to do the work that they do, going from town to town, healing and teaching, they had to eat. So Jesus says, I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. He's speaking about himself. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, Jesus says. But friends, the story doesn't end there. Jesus then walks right into the synagogue to continue the conversation. And there's a man there who is described to have had a shriveled hand. And Matthew tells us 
looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus. They ask him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And so the Pharisees are already made comfortable by their convenient omissions that Jesus points out. They try to go a step further. But listen to how Jesus responds. Remember these words, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Jesus says, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into the pit on the Sabbath, you will, not take, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And listen, we know exactly what the Pharisees are trying to do in this moment. They're not trying to have a theological conversation about the importance of the Sabbath. They want to bring charges against Jesus. They want um, him to heal the man so that he violates the rules of the Sabbath, which then had the effect of law. What does Jesus tell them? Jesus says, it is God that desires mercy, not sacrifice. And those who live with mercy would do the right thing. They would do the right thing. And at that time, and even today, there are very different schools of thought on how the Sabbath should be observed. And even though there were some rabbinic traditions that would likely have left the sheep to die, most Jews in the first century would have saved the sheep. Why? Because the sheep had died. It would have been inhumane and an unnecessary loss of a living being that had value for a family. They would have rescued the sheep. They would have shown mercy and done the right thing. So Jesus speaks about the sheep because Jesus knows the man with the shriveled hand was worthy of the same type of attention. And he wanted everyone in the synagogue to hear it, especially especially the Pharisees. This man with his infirmity was important in the eyes of God every single day of the week and worthy of healing. And so he says to the man, stretch out your hand. Stretch out your hand. That, friends, is resilience. Jesus speaking to the merciful, merciful nature of God and healing the man on the Sabbath his resilience, doing hard things, speaks to our resilience. And I'm reminded that much of the resilience displayed in everyday life is simply doing the right thing and showing mercy. Resilience is displayed every day by students that show kindness and grace to others despite the overwhelming array of school assignments and peer pressures things that are on their plate. Resilience is displayed by adult children caring for their parents, whether that's helping them with their day-to-day -day affairs or just being someone who visits and loves them. Resilience is displayed, resilience is displayed by business owners who sought to do the right thing by their employees throughout the pandemic, making sure that people that help them with their businesses are able to thrive in the midst of such challenges Resilience is displayed by teachers and by parents who've had to wrestle with the well-being of students while standards around health and safety shift all the time. Resilience is displayed by the people who look around and they see people who are suffering. They see people who are hurt and they don't walk away. They say, how can I help? There's another lesson here of the man that Jesus wanted to heal. The gospel says that the man, so he stretched it out and was completely restored just as sound as the other. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored just as sound as the other. This man had to stretch out his hand. Think about it. This man had to stretch out his hands. If his muscles were atrophy, then stretching would have likely been excruciating. 
and yet he stretched towards Jesus, and in doing so was he. Friends, sometimes we feel withered and incapable, and we struggle to be resilient. Or we're just plain tired of always having it together. But that's where Jesus plays such a strong role in our resilience when we reach out and we stretch towards Jesus Christ. We find the capacity to do the things that we have to do because he works in us, because he, he desires mercy and not sacrifice, because he wants to work in and through us. He desires mercy out of our lives. He desires for us to look at the world and not say, what's in it for me, but how can I help? Friends, we're not resilient because it's easy. We don't build resilience out of easy things. We don't build resilience because it's comfortable or because it's convenient. We are resilient because in this life there are simply things that must be done. There are situations to correct. There are wrongs that must be righted. There are people who require attention, love, care, and mercy. There are dreams to pursue and worthy goals to achieve. And Jesus goes with us as we stretch a hand to him and to those around us. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. So friends, each time we gather together as a community, Excuse me. We will celebrate Holy Communion. Communion is an opportunity for us to publicly declare our longing for God's presence. And here at Restoration Church, we practice an open table, which means it is not our table. It is not the United Methodist Church's table. It's not Mercer Middle School's table. It's not Jake's table. It's God's table. And everyone is welcome. All who belong for God's presence in their life. Uh, when you entered... Uh, uh, here at the school, uh, you were offered a card that says, My Prayer for Communion. Friends, this is an opportunity for you to write down um, something that's on your heart that's an offering to God. Um, and it's something that I will pray with you. Um, if you so desire to write a prayer as you're leaving today, you can just place it in the basket by the door as you pick up your uh, What's in a Name journal as well, as you pick that up. Um, and I will pray for it this week. Um, there will be a basket near the door, I said that. Okay. And alternatively, you can spend time inside the prayer um, if that would be more meaningful for you. And uh, Eddie's going to play a little bit, and we're just going to have a moment of silence. And then we'll pray a prayer of confession, which is a new prayer that we'll start using. Um, and it will be behind me in just a few moments. So uh, take some time and write um, a prayer if you so desire, or sit in silence. Friends, this uh, prayer of confession is a new one. And so let us um, let's pray together. It'll be on the screen behind me. Let us pray. Holy God, hear our prayer. For the mending of our hearts, torn apart by our unkindness, for the healing of our souls, wasting away from the despair around us, for the forgiveness we seek, for the sin we have allowed to persist, for the reconciliation of the world whose division condemns us. We pray for the courage to admit our fault, to strength to amend our actions, and the hope that your grace awaits us. Amen. Friends, on the night in which Christ would give himself up for us, he took bread, common food, and gave thanks to God. And he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples. He said, hey, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. As often as you eat of this, remember me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. And again, he first gave thanks to God, and then he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins as often as you dream of this. Remember me. Let us pray. Almighty and holy God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. 
Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world through your Son, Jesus Christ. With the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Friends, if you take your elements and you just tear off the first little piece of plastic, this is the body of Christ, given for each and every one of us. If you open the other Friends, this is the blood of Christ shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, why don't we uh, we stand up? We've been singing the same song at the end of every service this month, and Eddie just he says we get into rock and roll mode, right? And uh, so we're gonna do that again. So friends, let's sing with a joyful.
Amen. 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 Hey, friends. Um, like I said, we've been talking about resilience over the month of February. In January, we talked about hope. We're going to see some shifts in our culture and our society over the coming weeks. Not just because of how COVID is changing, but because of the issues happening in Ukraine and around our world. Um, and I think we all inherently know that we can do hard things. I think we all need to know that we can do hard things when we're rooted in the practices of Jesus Christ. In the teachings of Christ where Jesus says to the Pharisees that seek to make him uncomfortable, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Let us leave today remembering hope, remembering resilience, and remembering that the world desperately needs mercy, not sacrifice. The world needs love and not hate. The world needs grace and not judgment. And that's something each of us can bear witness to when we leave here today. The love, grace, and mercy of Jesus Christ, our Lord, rooted in our love of God and our love of neighbor. Friends, I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. I hope to see you on Ash Wednesday. I hope that you'll pick up one of these journals so that you can deepen your faith over the, the time of Lent. Friends, I just hope you're doing well, okay? So go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and may the grace, mercy, and love of Christ be with you all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen.